Good morning. In today's headlines, the Washington Monument was vandalized Tuesday night. The base was graffitied and splashed with red paint. Police took one man into custody. A group of Republican lawmakers is working toward banning gender transition surgeries on minors. They gathered outside the U.S. Capitol yesterday to call for support of a new bill. Iranian protesters take to the streets in Istanbul over the death of a young woman at the hands of Iran's morality police. They have been increasingly targeting women in recent months for not properly wearing the Islamic headscarf known as hijab. Europe's coal purchases are on the rise as it braces for a tough winter. With Russian natural gas imports banned, Europe is looking elsewhere to satisfy its energy needs. And a feel-good story about a special bond of a six-year-old with her miniature horse that will brighten up your day. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. And I'm Evelyn Lee. Good morning. Today's Wednesday, September 21st. And just last night, a man went up to the Washington Monument and vandalized it with red paint. Park police say they have the suspect in custody. The men allegedly wrote a profane message and splashed the base of the monument with red paint. It's not clear, though, who he is and why he did it. But for now, the site will remain closed. It usually opens to the public at 10 a.m., but whether tourists will be able to visit today is yet to be determined. National Park Service conservators will handle cleaning and repairs, and police say the investigation is ongoing. More news out of Washington. The Democrat-controlled House Oversight Committee has voted down a GOP effort to investigate President Biden's son Hunter over his foreign business dealings. Republicans had proposed a resolution seeking, asking the president to hand over documents relating to Hunter's business affairs. Oversight panel member James Comer accused the Biden family of selling access to the highest levels of government. He says President Biden needs to answer questions about his family's business with adversaries like the Chinese Communist Party. This likely refers to emails sourced from Hunter's laptop that showed he had communications with a CCP-linked Chinese energy firm. In those emails, there was a suggestion that a 10 percent cut in a corporate organization would go to the so-called big guy. A Hunter Biden business associate later said this is a reference to Joe Biden. Meanwhile, committee chairwoman Carolyn Maloney said Republicans have misplaced priorities by trying to investigate the Bidens. Some Republican lawmakers are working to ban gender transition surgeries on minors. They gathered outside the U.S. Capitol yesterday calling for support of a bill. And today's Jeremy Sandberg tells us more. The Protect Children's Innocence Act would make it a Class C felony to help a minor change their biological sex. This should never happen in the United States of America. As a matter of fact, it should never happen anywhere in the world. But there's an ideology that is sexualizing children and pushing this among the most innocent kids, the most vulnerable in all of our society, and it has to end. The author of the bill, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, and 10 other Republican legislators are calling for action. We ought to have 400 members of Congress standing here with us today to stand up and fight against mutilation and abuse of children. Why wouldn't every member of Congress be here? Those that perform sex change operations on minors or administer puberty blockers or cross sex hormones to them would be charged. The bill would also prohibit federal taxpayer funding for the procedures forbid institutions from providing instructions for them, and prevent aliens that have performed the procedures on minors from receiving a visa. Those that already have a visa would be eligible for deportation. If you participated in this, I advise you to, to prepare your, your lives for incarceration because we're going to pass this bill next year and it's going to have teeth. There will be no statute of limitations. The penalty would be up to 25 years in prison or a maximum $250,000 fine. 18-year-old Chloe Cole, an ex-transgender teen that started transitioning at the age of 12 and had a double mastectomy when she was 15, says she supports the bill. How did we get to the point where nearly every pediatric institution in the country considers it best practice to remove the healthy breast tissue of children while administering drugs typically used to chemically castrate high-risk sex offenders? Cole says when she was 16, she realized she made a mistake. She now feels the beauty of motherhood was stolen from her. No child deserves to suffer under the knife of a gender-affirming surgeon. 
America's children, all children, deserve better. Green says different laws in various states call for a federal law and is confident the bill will pass in Congress. The act currently has 35 sponsors in the House, all Republicans. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Media have been tracking a flight reportedly carrying illegal immigrants to Delaware near President Biden's home. Delaware officials are preparing to receive the migrants, and the White House says it's aware of the reports. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. I don't have the specific White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said they were aware of reports of a flight from Texas carrying migrants to an area near President Biden's vacation home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. I can tell you that we've been closely coordinating uh, with um, uh, uh, the folks in Delaware, the officials in Delaware. What I can tell you that uh, our heads up did not come from Governor DeSantis because his only goal is, uh, as he's made it really quick, clear, is to create chaos. And you Biden appeared unmoved at the possibility. Are you sending uh, migrants to Delaware? Do you have any comment or response to that, sir? He should come visit. We have a beautiful shoreline. Meanwhile, in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis said he couldn't confirm the flight of illegal immigrants to Delaware. I haven't heard a peep about all the people that have been told by Biden you can just come in and they're going, they're being abused by the cartels, they're drowning in the Rio Grande. You had 50 that died in some shed in Texas. I heard no outrage about any of that. Uh, I haven't heard outrage about all the fentanyl that's come across the border that's killing Americans in record numbers. I don't hear... I don't hear outrage about the criminal aliens that have gotten through and have then victimized people, not only in Florida, but all throughout the country. I didn't hear any outrage about that. The only thing I hear them getting upset about is you have 50 that end up in Martha's Vineyard. Then they get really upset. I spoke with Dan Stein, president of the Federation for American Immigration Reform, or FAIR, and he added this. Well, the big problem and the elephant in the room is why did Joe Biden destroy immigration controls in the first place? Then he explained some of the effects of illegal immigration. It causes housing shortages and overcrowding, reduces wages, erodes the bargaining leverage of American workers, and generally destroys the American quality of life. It doesn't matter what you're trying to do. If you can't project the number of people using something, schools, hospitals, or what have you, you can't provide adequate government infrastructure to provide those services. And it's basic common sense. U.S. Customs and Border Protection reported that agents have encountered over 2 million illegal immigrants in the last 11 months. Jason Perry, NTD News. President Biden said that his administration is working with Mexico and other countries to stop illegal immigration. He commented that there are fewer immigrants from Mexico and most of Central America, but more from Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. I wonder where that flight is. Well, flight tracking websites appeared to show that plane was set to land in Delaware at around 1.30 p.m. yesterday, but apparently it went to New Jersey instead. Interesting. Yesterday, a lot of media agencies were waiting at the airport. And in other news, MyPillow CEO Mike Lindell is suing the U.S. Justice Department. He's demanding the return of a cell phone that FBI agents seized last week. Lindell's suit alleges agents stopped him at a fast food restaurant's drive through window. They questioned him about his claims that the 2020 U.S. election was rigged. The agents then produced a warrant and told Lindell to surrender the phone. The FBI confirmed its agents executed a search warrant at that location. Lindell says FBI agents asked him about Tina Peters, a Mesa County, Colorado clerk. State authorities have accused Peters of allowing an unauthorized person to break into the county's election system. Allegedly, this was to search for evidence supporting former President Trump's election fraud claims. Potential war crimes in Ukraine. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland met with Ukrainian Prosecutor General Andriy Kostin on Tuesday. Discussions revolved around investigating alleged atrocities that have occurred since Russia launched its invasion. We know that the road ahead is neither short nor easy, but we and our Ukrainian partners will work tirelessly to pursue truth and justice. Our message is clear. There is no hiding place for the perpetrators of these atrocities. The world has seen, the world has seen significant number of heinous war crimes committed by Russian forces and their proxies in 
Bucha and other cities throughout Ukraine. Unfortunately, the story repeats itself in recently liberated territories. Garland and Kostin signed an agreement enabling their two governments to work more closely to identify, apprehend, and prosecute those involved in war crimes. Kostin said Tuesday that another mass grave with possibly 100 bodies was discovered in the counteroffensive area. Last week, President Volodymyr Zelensky said nearly 450 graves were discovered in a forest on the northern outskirts of Izium. Investigators are exhuming the bodies to start the grim job of identification. In another development, residents in Russian-controlled regions of eastern and southern Ukraine are planning to vote on whether to become part of Russia. In related news, Russian President Vladimir Putin has called up 300,000 reservists today to fight in Ukraine. This is Russia's first such mobilization since World War II and signified a major escalation of the war now in its seventh month. And moving on now, a group of Iranian protesters rallied in Istanbul on Tuesday over the death of a young woman in police custody. Mesa Amini, a 22-year-old from Iran's Kurdistan province, fell into a coma after being arrested by Iran's morality police. Her death has sparked nationwide anger and protests in several cities, including in the capital Tehran. Police say Amini fell ill as she waited with other women held by the morality police who enforce strict rules requiring, requiring women to cover their hair and wear loose-fitting clothes in public. Her father holds the police responsible for her death. Iran faced international criticism on Tuesday, on Tuesday over the death, which ignited three days of protests. Clashes with security forces in the capital and other unrest claimed at least three lives. The governor of Tehran province accused foreign embassies of fanning the protest and said three foreign nationals had been arrested. Just ahead, Europe ramps up its coal purchases as it braces for winter. Figures show that purchases have increased nearly tenfold as natural gas imports from Russia continue to be banned and Europe looks to China to satisfy its energy needs. And one expert says airline disruptions will last longer than we may think. How should we best get to our destinations? Find out more after the break. Freedom is not free, and neither is the truth. In order to bring you the facts, our reporters are out there on the front lines getting the true story. Some of them served 10 years of prison in China. We've been censored on social media. Our Hong Kong printing offices were set on fire, and we've been repeatedly attacked by the Chinese Communist Party. But no matter what, we believe that you deserve the truth, and so we continue to bring the truth to light. Head on over to getepic.com and try honor journalism that is based in truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held from September 29th to October 2nd at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com. Welcome back. Canada is likely dropping their requirement for foreign nationals to be vaccinated to enter the country. That's according to an official familiar with the matter. He says the move could happen by the end of September. Random COVID-19 testing at airports and filling out information on the Arrive Can app will also no longer be required. Unvaccinated travelers who are allowed to enter Canada are currently subject to mandatory arrival tests and a 14-day quarantine. The official spoke on condition of anonymity as they were not authorized to speak publicly on the matter. And it seems that we left the chaotic summer travel season behind us. Especially airlines have scaled back schedules to give themselves a bit of breathing room. But one aviation expert says that the problems are more complex than we realized. And disruptions might persist until 2024. According to the Department of Transportation, between January and June last year, more than 80% of complaints focused on refunds. That's up significantly from years before. But in many cases, people were left waiting or were denied. I spoke to an expert to find out what we can do. 
We're bringing in Jay Ratliff to speak about this. He is an airline analyst and journalist. Good to have you, Jay. Uh, good to be here. I mean, with all those disruptions at the airport right now, what precautions do you take when you fly these days so that you feel more secure? Well, my wife and I just returned from San Diego from our, our home here in Savannah. And one of the things we always do when we fly, and we fly a lot, is to try to catch the originating flight in the morning. Uh, that's the first flight out of the day. It stands the best chance of being dispatched on time. And during the decades I was in the airline industry with Northwest Airlines, there was no more important departure than that first flight out of the day. Plus, the airplane's going to be cleaner. Uh, it's going to be already at the airport. You don't have to worry about normally an originating aircraft coming in from another destination. So the plane and the crew is there. And the likelihood of that thing being dispatched on time are very high. Uh, that's one of the things that, uh, that I do to kind of help increase the chances of not having too many bumps along the road. What if the flight just gets canceled and you get stuck? How do you make sure you know you get you don't lose your money altogether? Well, one of the things that I do if I'm seated at a connecting airport and I don't see the airplane that we're going to be flying out on, I go to flightaware.com. Uh, flightaware.com is a free site. You can put in your flight number at the top and it'll show you the status of your flight. But more importantly, a link at the top will allow you to track the inbound flight. You simply click on that and you see where your aircraft is at in relation to the airport that you're located. At the airport, we use these, this app all the time. So if you know that you've got a 45 minute connection, but you see the flights coming in an hour and 10 minutes late, you can immediately then get a hold of one of the representatives at the airport and say, look, I'm worried about my connection. I see what time this flight's coming in and I don't know if you're gonna be able to turn the airplane that fast, it's gonna be kind of tight. What options do I have? Uh, sometimes by getting ahead of it, if there's only a couple of other uh, seats on another flight, you might get the advantage of snagging it before that flight is full. But if the flight is canceled and they're trying to get you back to your destination, uh, believe me, the agent's doing everything in their possible to make it happen. Uh, so obviously be as kind and polite to them as you can, but give them options. Uh, my wife and I were stuck recently at JFK in, in New York, and the agent for American Airlines was trying to get us back to uh, Dayton, Ohio. Uh, eventually, after eight or nine hours of weather delays, I said, look, just get us to any city in the state of Ohio, Toledo, Cleveland, I don't care. Uh, we'll rent a car at our expense and get us to our destination. When we did that, it opened up all kinds of options to the agent that allowed us to get home that day versus being overnighted at that airport, which coming off of a two-week European trip was the last thing that we wanted. So if you can give the option to the agent, it's going to help them uh, get you to at least close to your destination. Right. That's a very good point and very interesting. And also I've read there are blogs that say it can be lucrative even to get, you know, this vol voluntary denied boarding compensation in case of well, overbooked flights. I mean, how do we negotiate there? Well, a lot of times when you check in online with an airline, uh, Delta, for example, they'll say there's a possibility this flight may be oversold. In other words, we've made more reservations than we have seats. If all those people show up, we're going to be looking for volunteers. So it says, what would it take for you to give up your seat? And you put in a dollar amount. Uh, some people put in $150, $200 new, at least $500 or $1,000 minimum. And then that way, if the flight's oversold, they'll, pay, they'll call you up to the, the, the desk and say, are you still willing to give up your seat? And yes, you know, for the 1000 or whatever I put down. But please, before you take that offer, find out when they're going to be able to get you to your destination. Because if they only operate two or three flights a week and you're going to be there from a Monday to a Wednesday, you might need to consider if that money is going to be worth it. Uh, but these days we're seeing airlines that are severely overbooked giving uh, two, three, four thousand dollars a passenger. So please don't sell yourself short if you're looking at possibly giving your seat up. Mm, very oh. interesting. And I'm sure not enough people know about this. So thank you so much for your advice. I really appreciate it. Jay Ratliff. Now on to the energy crisis in Europe. Despite the EU's renewable energy goals, a desperate need for power is forcing it to embrace the world's most polluting energy source. NTD's Kost Temenes tells us more. As a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, many European countries have lost access to vital supplies of natural gas and coal from Russia, their top provider. EU countries are now looking for new sources of energy. Europe's coal imports from South Africa were nine times higher in the first half of this year. Since the start of the Russian invasion, Europe's combined coal purchases from South Africa, Australia and Indonesia 
rose by a thousand percent. Coal mining companies' profit margins have more than tripled since 2020, from $75 per ton to $235 per ton. Coal is by far the dirtiest form of energy, creating a lot of air pollution. It is responsible for far more deaths than any other energy source. Despite that, a significant proportion of Europe's power still comes from coal, even though many countries have pledged to phase it out in the coming decade. Now that Russian coal imports have been banned, much of Europe's coal comes from China, a country that has been supportive of Russia's motives of the invasion. And China is importing coal from Russia at record levels. To prepare for what may be a difficult winter, European countries have temporarily set aside environmental goals as they seek to stockpile coal and reopen coal plants. Costa Menes, NTD News. In business news, Gap is eliminating about 500 corporate jobs. This comes after the retailer reported weak first quarter earnings and sliding sales at its flagship brand Old Navy. A person familiar with the situation says the cuts include layoffs and eliminating open positions in its New York, San Francisco and Asia offices. The Wall Street Journal reports the layoffs have already started. Meanwhile, Gap is still searching for a permanent leader after its CEO stepped down in July. Coming up next, a new song will soon be ringing through the Milky Way as a U.S. agency puts together a special anthem. And a six-year-old girl's adorable bond with her miniature horse will brighten up your day. Watch our feel-good stories after the break. Communism is evil. Oh, come on. Listen. If you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So, I'll see you there. I love you! Good to have you back with us. The U.S. Space Force has officially adopted its own song titled Semper Supra. It unveiled the song yesterday during the Air, Space and Cyber Conference in National Harbor, Maryland. The Space Force is the newest military branch established in 2019. The title Semper Supra comes from the U.S. Space Force motto, which is Latin for Always Above. The song seeks to capture the spirit of both current and future guardians, which is the name given to Space Force personnel. It also strives to bring together service members by giving them a sense of pride. Every branch of the armed forces has an official song, so it's great that the Space Force now has theirs. Yeah, and two former service members collaborated to create the song. It actually took years of research and revisions before they got it just right. I can imagine that. (laughs) Well, I'm going to end the show with an adorable bond between a miniature horse and a six-year-old. Take a look at why the internet can't get enough of this heartwarming duo. For her third birthday, Ella was given something every little girl dreams of. It's the best birthday gift the... You ever get, I think. (laughs) Meet Black, the miniature horse, and his best friend, Ella. This little girl from Norway brightens up the internet each day with her sweet, caring friendship with Black. They do everything together. They play shop, share popsicles, ride together. Black even partakes in makeovers that include pony glitter pedicures. (laughs) He is the best. He is so kind and so patient. It's not all just play for Ella, though. She has learned a lot of responsibility and takes good care of him. She grooms his mane, helps with stable work, 
and takes great pride in cleaning up his manure. I, I try to help and she just, uh, no, 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 mommy, I do it, I do it, don't do it. Ella's parents, Line and Thomas, brought their dream home on a farm in 2014. They love that horses help them connect together as a family, partaking in the adventures that Ella sets for Black. That's her choice to do what she wants with him, and we just are the parents who, yeah, <laughs> make it all safe. <laughs> they chronicle daily life with Ella and their horses on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. There's a reason behind their antics, such as dressing up in loud and bright costumes. It trains a horse to be confident and not afraid if something unexpected were to come its way while out riding, creating a safer environment for horse and rider alike. Because when we do things like that, the horses are used to stuff in the world. So what does Black think about all this? I think he loves the attention he gets because uh, we spend so much time with him and uh, he meets us every day and yeah, do you want to play with me or do you want to do something with me? And she just wants to have fun and uh, yeah, with her best friends. And for now, they will just keep on playing and including Black in all the fun to be had. It brings joy to her parents to watch and anyone else who stumbles on their social media posts. All horses deserve to be loved. And a child's love is the most pure love you can find. So, yes. <laughs> Oh, that just immediately made me smile. Oh, I know. Yeah, and so Evelyn, the saying goes, a stubborn horse walks behind you, an impatient horse walks in front of you, but a noble companion walks beside you. Have you heard that before? I haven't. I haven't, but I, I like it. It sounds like black is one noble companion. Yeah, it seems so, and it's really great how animals can help bring the family together. That's right. Well, what a great way to end the show. But before you go, we'd love to hear from you. You can share your thoughts and your story at goodmorning at ntd.com. So shoot us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.